Uh, last week, we looked at basically just an overview of how we got our Bibles. How do we get this Bible that we've got in our hands? We saw, um, we saw the type of materials they used for manuscripts. We saw the kind of, of manuscripts, the scroll, the codex. We saw the type of letters they wrote with. We looked at two important manuscripts last week. One of them, both of them actually, we had on the wall projected. And, um, and one thing that we saw was from the very beginning of the New Testament, we looked in the New Testament, there's copying going on. They're, they're writing the Scripture, the apostles and those under them. They're writing the Scripture. They're passing along. There's copies made. And we saw all of that. And what I want us to look at tonight is something you all already know about. You just may not realize it yet, but you all have been experienced to it already. And the, the way that you've been exposed to this that we're going to be seeing tonight is the fact that we have English Bibles. And almost in every English Bible, you have footnotes. You have things in the references. And you've seen places in the Bible that says something like this, haven't you? You're reading in the Bible, whether you have a study Bible or not, and it says, some manuscripts say this. Any of you remember seeing that in the Bible when you read? Or you're reading uh, maybe a study Bible, and you'll see a little note at the bottom. Some ancient manuscripts say this. Well, what is that? What's going on there when you see these things in your Bibles? Some Bibles have more than that. If you have a reference Bible, you probably have several of those places. If you have something more of a text Bible that only has, for the most part, the actual words of Scripture, you'll see fewer places like that. The fact is, you see that in the Bible. So you already know something about this. So I want to go ahead and pass this out to you all. And this is some of you participated in this and some of you did not two weeks ago. But what I want us to see tonight is how good of scribes some of you were two weeks ago. And the reason for this is it's really going to help us understand what's going on in our Bibles whenever... I'll just lay one here, Wes, or two or so, if somebody comes in late. So and I'll explain this in just a minute. But this... I think it's going to be very helpful for us to see some of the things that occur two weeks ago when you all were making copies. Now, one of the copies, one of the scribes that I got to work on this was outside of our Wednesday night class, and it wasn't exactly the same um, environment, but still, that's that's good, though, because when you look at the manuscripts, they're not all written and, and uh, copied in the same environments. So here is the general flow. You have the New Testament writers. They're writing out the Bible. They're inspired by the Spirit. You've got copies being sent out. After some time, very early, you have collections of these copies. You find very early the four Gospels collected in a codex, or another word for that, just a regular book. You have, you have Paul's letters. You have the New Testament coming together, the Old Testament, into a collection, into a book. And we go on, and we go on, and we go on. Do any of you remember the man I mentioned last week about the Greek New Testament? A name, a famous, a fairly famous name. Erasmus, yes. Erasmus, the first man to publish a Greek New Testament. And what he did was basically take seven, um, or so Greek manuscripts, put them together, examine them, look at them, and make the Greek New Testament. And you may ask, now why did he need more than one manuscript? Well, that's what we're going to see tonight. And it's going to help us be able to trust our Bibles more. I said this some weeks ago. It's something for us to remember, though, is never be afraid of the truth. Never be afraid of the truth. Jesus said the truth will set you free. Now, his usage of truth there in the book of John may be a little bit different than what we're talking about tonight. The principle is the same, though. The truth will set us free. Never be afraid of, of this or that. Or I told you the story about Hebrews, how I was scared of the warning passages, and I was scared to look at a commentary. 
And finally, I went to that commentary and it helped me so much. I saw that I wasn't condemned. I saw that God had had mercy on me. So what we're going to see tonight is something, like I said, you know about already, and yet it's a little a little different maybe than what you've thought about. So here's one of the reasons we're looking at what we're going to look at. is because if, if any of you have, have seen or listened to skeptics before, if any of you have maybe read books about the Bible or read books against the Bible, you're looking at news stories on your phone, or if you are um, watching some channel on television and you, a, news, a show comes out and it's talking about all the errors of the Bible and how we can't trust the Bible and all that, this is one of the arguments people will make. People will say, how can you trust the Bible when there are thousands of variants in the manuscripts? Now, a variant is just simply something that's different than one manuscript to the next manuscript. That's what they're talking about when they talk about variants here. Um, and you have people say something like this, especially one famous skeptic, who will say there's more variants in the New Testament than there are words in the New Testament. From a strict standpoint, that is true. And yet that should not bother you, as we're going to see tonight. Because the big question is not, do we have variants? The big question is, what type of variants do we have? That's the big question for us to think about tonight. Now, what is a variant? A variant, very plainly, is, is a change that's happened in manuscripts. So you have one manuscript, and I'll just make this up. It says uh, purple in this one manuscript. And this other manuscript, it says black. That's a variant. That's a change. So here's what we're going to do right now. We're going to look at this paper I've passed out to you. And uh, for those who will be watching this later, I'm planning on putting a this document in, in the file where you can click on it and see it while you watch. But what I did two or three weeks ago is, and this is all from the New American Standard Bible, the 1995 update, is on Acts 25-23, I read that scripture to you and gave you time to write it down. And then on 1 Corinthians 13, 7, I read this verse, a much shorter and simpler and more familiar verse to you all, had you write it down. And then on the back, on Luke 3, 1, I had you all, whoever wanted to participate in this, pick up one of our pew Bibles and look at the pew Bible and write down the verse. And what I want us to see are the type of mistakes that were made during this. And they're mistakes that we should be expecting, honestly. So, five different examples here under Acts 25, 23. And I'll give you just maybe 30 seconds. Look over these and think about how many variants you see here. How many variants do you see in these five verses? or five examples of this one verse. And as you're looking, again, a variant is not how many times this change, I'll say this, how many times the change happens. That's not 12 variants, it's just one variant, just one change. It doesn't matter how many manuscripts it shows up in. So just look over these five examples very quickly and just tell me how many variants you think are in them. And I'll tell you when I'm ready for that. All right, does anybody want to give us a guess at how many variants we have here in these five examples under Acts 25, 23 that we have here? Yes. Five, okay. We got one person that says five. All right. Seventeen. Okay. Does anybody else want to talk about a variant here? There are at least 21 variants out of the examples that were copied from Acts 25, 23. So, four of these were made two or three weeks ago here. One was made uh, later by somebody else, later than that. 
And here's one thing I want you to see, and this is very important for when you hear skeptics talk about all these variants in the Bible. Virtually everything we're going to look at tonight from just the examples from us are spelling examples. You see, the skeptics don't want to tell you what type of variants they're talking about. Look here at the at number one. Where this All that I'm saying now is under Acts 25-23. Number one, the word Agrippa there. In these five examples, Agrippa is spelled four different ways, I think. That all counts as a variant. Bernice is spelled two different ways. Three, actually. Look what it says in, in the first example. It says, So on the next day when Agrippa came together with her niece... That sounds really similar to Bernice, doesn't it? And that's the type of thing that can happen even when... And and listen, you all came in, you weren't expecting to make any copies of the Bible two weeks ago. But even people who got down and sat down to make copies of the Bible, they knew what they were going to do. And maybe they were listening to someone. This is a very easily made mistake, isn't it? Very easy. So when you think about... Um, Erasmus had roughly seven manuscripts when he put together in 1516 the Greek New Testament. We have about 6,000 right now. What if this first example was our only example of the Bible copied down from history? We all would be saying, so on the next day Agrippa came together with her niece. So you see, having all these different manuscripts and examining them together is a good thing for us to have. It's a good thing. And what you can see there, it says her niece. It's very easy, very easy to look at. If we had 10 or 20 or 30 people doing this, probably no one else would have said her niece. And it would have been very, very easy to simply say, hey, it's Bernice. They heard wrong. I mean, we see that here. Now, if you look on number three, it says came together with Tabor. They may have put Bernice there. I couldn't read it, to be honest with you. But it was, you know, it it was kind of, I couldn't tell what it was. Again, easy to see the mistake there, though. Easy to understand what's going on there. Let me show you something else. Festus is spelled two different ways, at least, in this. That's two variants. Accompanied is spelled two or three different ways. That would be counted as a variant. The abbreviation in 1 and 2, the W and the slash, we all know that means with. But in 3, 4, it says with. That's a variant. And they used abbreviations in the New Testament at times when they made manuscripts. So what you're seeing here is that um, virtually every single variant that you see in the five copies that we made were spelling variants. There is a line in verse 3. I see that line is there. They left that blank. They left it blank. Maybe they couldn't keep up. They couldn't remember. They just left it blank. They didn't write the word there. That would be easily seen through other manuscripts what's going on, what word ought to go there. So this is one thing I'm going to stress, and it's on the back of your paper. The vast majority of changes have to do with spelling, Vast majority of changes are easily or pretty easily able to go back, get back to the original. No doctrine has been changed. That's with the New Testament, but that's with what we're looking at here. When you look at these five examples that we have, you say, well, yeah, there's differences. There's nothing of significance here, though. We can see what's going on. Okay? Now, we're going to look at these other two, too, but any questions there on this first list that we see? Well, look down in under 1 Corinthians 13, 7. This, of course, is a shorter verse. This, of course, is um, a more familiar verse. Some of you may even have this memorized. And this is an easier verse. I mean, there's no... In, in the first section, we've got Agrippa, we've got Bernice, we've got even words like auditorium, accompanied. We have... Uh, uh, Festus, and we have other things too. I didn't even mention we have that plus sign. 
You know, that's an abbreviation for N. But you have these longer words, you have these names that aren't that familiar. Here in 1 Corinthians 13, you don't have any of that. So just take a, just a, a short time, look over these, and, and try to tell me how many variants you think appear in this section. One person, there's four there, not five. One person basically didn't write out the verse. Maybe this person didn't want to or they didn't have time. So we've got four of the five here. All right, anybody want to take a guess at how many variants we've got here? Got one person saying three. Three. That's what I have. I put at least three. So somebody name for me a few of these variants that you see. Yeah. Number two, it says theirs. Theirs? That sounds like bears, doesn't it? Theirs, bears. What else? What other variants do you see? I'm sorry? Believes. Yep, believes, right? That right on that number two is misspelled there. Were any of you trying to corrupt God's word when you're making these copies? No. These are simple mistakes. And these are mistakes that we should expect because God didn't bring his word down on from heaven and just, just lay it there for all of us to see. And God used regular people to write out His words through the centuries. You come to church tonight, this is uh, 1,700 years ago, there's no printing press. You say, you know what, I gave my copy of Ephesians to my, my sister or my brother. Can I make a copy of Ephesians again? You make a copy. You do your best, and you may accidentally make a mistake and spell believes wrong. Does, that, does spelling believes wrong there change the Bible really? No. In fact, in the Bible, uh, in the manuscripts, you'll see like John spelled with, spelled differently. I mean, it's, it's still John though. All right, who else can see a variant there in 1 Corinthians 13, 7? Right. So on, on line three, instead of saying hopes, you have hope. And you can easily see, and if, obviously, if we had 20, 30, 40, 6,000 people making copies of this. Uh, even with just four that we have here, it's easy to see that hope should have been hopes. So, again, so what kind of, what kind of variants do we have here? Spelling. Spelling. Mishearing words. Now, I do want to make this clear. There are more difficult things in the New Testament, but, but by and large, without question, this is almost, this is the vast, vast, vast majority of everything. So when you hear skeptics talk about all the errors in the manuscripts, how can we possibly know what's going on? They're either naive, or on one level at least, they're being deceptive. I mean, it's just not that way. You know what this is like? When people talk about there being more errors or variants in the Bible in the New Testament than words in the New Testament. Do you, do you remember a few years back when, when Planned Parenthood said that only 3% of what they do is abortions? That's the same type of abuse of statistics as what we're looking at tonight. Um, 3% of what a Planned Parenthood does is abortions. We, we basically do no abortions, some people may say. It's an abuse of statistics. Same thing here. When skeptics say, look at all these mistakes in the manuscripts, they don't tell you, oh, you know, they're spelling. Was Philip spelled with one L or two L's here? What's that? They probably do 3% of what they do is not. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So any you know another thing I was thinking about? I, I think with skeptics, it's more of a I I, I really I, I believe that their heart is like going in their head, going in their head, going in their heart. They don't yes. want to see or they don't want 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. With that said, let's turn our Bibles before we go to the last one. Turn to Matthew 20. Eight. That is a very important point. And I saw this somewhere else recently as well. The problem with skeptics, now I use that word just very broadly, there can be people who are skeptics. I'm, let me say it this way, I'm skeptical. By nature, I'm skeptical. That's not a bad thing. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way. All I mean is simply this, I tend to have to prove things. <laughs> I'm kind of like that. I'm, I'm of that makeup. That's not always a bad thing. So you can have skeptics, people who are skeptical of the Bible, and yet they're open and God's working with them. And then you can have on the other side is skeptics who just reject everything. They don't care. They don't want it. They're, they're quite closed-minded. Look here. Actually, go to Matthew 27. We'll see an example of this. And while we're looking at this, keep this in mind, just like brother, our brother said, primarily it's not the head that's wrong with people. It is the heart that's wrong with people. Uh, there's a sin that people want to keep. There's their, their own autonomy, their own power they want to keep. They don't want to acknowledge and worship God, so they'll do anything they can to, to keep this unbelief going. In... In 27, chapter 27, I'm trying to find the place where they say, you know, if you come down, we'll believe you. Forty-two. Yes, yes, thank you. Verse 42, He saved others, He cannot save Himself. He is the King of Israel. Let Him now come down from the cross, and we will believe in Him. If you come down, we'll believe in you right now. If you show your power, we'll believe in you. Why doesn't God do that to more people? Uh, you've got people, they say, God, if only you show me a sign, I'll believe in you. God, if you would do this for me, I would believe in you. God, if you'd come to me in a vision, I'd believe in you. And the reason that God normally doesn't do things like that is because it wouldn't help. That's what He did in the Old Testament with people. He showed Himself all the time in the Old Testament, and people still rejected Him. Now look in chapter 28. And start in verse 11. Now while they were on their way, some of the guard came. This is the Roman guard. What would they have to gain by lying? The only thing they would have to gain is losing their life because they didn't do their job. These people are telling the truth. Now while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you are to say, His disciples came by night and stole Him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win Him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. So there's the proof they needed. And it's the proof they rejected. They didn't, they didn't care about it. You have, you have eyewitness testimony from these Roman guards who could very well lose their life for telling this. And they say, okay, here's some money. We'll take care of it. We're not going to believe in you. It's a heart problem. All right. Oh. 
That's so true. Yes. 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 Yeah, Lazarus was already raised, and they still didn't believe. They wanted to kill him, not to worship him. So we see, we see these things happening in the Bible, and uh, probably some of the people who were there in 27, they were there in 28 of Matthew. So it, what we're looking at tonight is very important. We want to believe in our, in our faith. We want to know if we have reason to believe, and we certainly do. At the same time, our belief ultimately doesn't come from knowing the facts, as important as that is. It's receiving through the Spirit the revelation of God given to us. That's it. Anybody else before we go on to our last example? All right, Luke chapter 3, verse 1, on the back of the page. Now, this is the time where uh, people had the Pew Bibles. They were looking at the Pew Bibles for themselves and writing down for themselves. There was no... I wasn't reading anything to anybody from the Bible. Take about 30 seconds, maybe a little bit longer on this one because it's, it's a little bigger, and see how many variants you think are in here. Well, does anybody have a guess for us? I got to look over these and, and make marks, so I'll have the advantage over you all. How many variants do you all think are in these five examples before us? Okay. Three. Anybody else? There are at least 16. Um, look in the second example. Tiberius is spelled wrong. Um, there's a comma there, which in the original Greek there was no punctuation, but in the verse you all were copying there was, so we counted that. The comma was supposed to be there, but if you look in example one, the comma is not there, so that's a variant. Uh, the word in number two is, the uh, I think the second occurrence of tetriarch is spelled differently. And you see those dots at the end of example two. Uh, it, there was a word there, but I couldn't make it out, so I just put dots there. I couldn't, I couldn't make it out. And then you see that word just after the dot starts with a C instead of an L, and it's spelled a little bit different. They may have written an L, but I couldn't make it out. It looked like a C to me, so I put a C. In number three, Philip has two L's as other places have one L. The end of number three, you've got a period there instead of a comma. We'll go back to number four. Number four is really important, but look at number five. Caesar is spelled differently. Again, these things are so small, they don't matter, do they? But these are, these are the vast, vast majority of the mistakes or variants you find in the Bible. That's why don't be disturbed when you hear skeptics talk like this. Caesar's spelled wrong. Pontius is spelled differently. Um, Aturia is spelled differently there on the last line of, of number five. And I'm sure there are others I did not underline as well. But look in number four. Number four is very important here. You have some misspellings on number four. Now remember, you're... These are, people are looking at the actual Bible and copying it, and they're still misspelling. I mean, we're all just human, aren't we? Now, look at the second line on number four. Do you see anything different there? The region of. So, out of all these examples, what you have on the second line, it says... And Herod was tetriarch of the region of Galilee. Now, where do you think of the region or the region of came from? 
Same exact translations. If you look at the Pew Bible, the line just under that to the right says uh, of the region or the region of of something else. If you look on down in, in these examples, it says of the region of Arturia. So what happened? Someone's eyes was, were copying. They looked down, they looked back up, and they saw the next line. These are just simple, basic mistakes that anybody could make. And this, these are the vast majority of variants that you see in the 6,000 manuscripts that we have. So the main thing that we've seen tonight in all these verses is spelling, spelling, spelling. You see some abbreviations, which is just another, I guess you could say, subset of spelling. You see an accidental addition there in number 4 under Luke 3.1. And I know that you all and others, were they were the ones doing this. These aren't the manuscripts, but these are some of the same things that happened when, when normal people a thousand years ago copied the manuscripts. And that's why it's very important for us to have all these manuscripts and scholars to examine them, to look at them, and uh, to give us Greek texts to, that our Bibles are based on here. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? Anything about these three examples? Again, let me just highlight these. I got them down in your paper. The vast majority of changes or variants have to do with spelling. Spelling. I mean, the copyists, listen, at the very beginning, the apostles were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write. They wrote with no errors. But we've got, you know, 1400 years until the printing press. But spelling, spelling, people are just human. But God has preserved His Word through the centuries through these men and scholars come together, get the manuscripts together, and look at them. The vast majority of changes are easily or pretty easily able to get back to the original. Number three is really important. None of the variants in the New Testament that have any slight um, chance of being in the Bible make no changes at all to the doctrine. Um, for instance, back in, in Acts 25, it says her niece in that one copy. Well, nobody thinks her niece is actually what the Bible said, though. So it doesn't matter if it says her niece. So not, none of the things, if you got your margins or it's on the bottom or the side or the middle in your references, know this, that they're faithful men of God trying to help us see the truth and that those differences you see, they make no real difference at all. In the Bible, okay? Is there any comments or questions about this? Let me just mention one more objection to the Bible besides the variance. One objection to the Bible is the telephone game. You ever play telephone before? You all know what that is? It's when, uh, you all have probably done it before, maybe you call it a different thing. It's when uh, somebody has a statement and they whisper it to somebody else and they keep whispering it all the way around the room and then this last person tells everybody the statement and it's completely different than the first person's statement. A lot of people, or some people, view the Bible that way. They say, well, how can we possibly know what the Bible says? It's one big game of telephone. I mean, the apostles said this, but how in the world do we know in 2021, what the Bible actually says, it's just been passed down all these years. Does anybody have an answer to that tonight?
I see what you're saying. As well as when people really want to get it right and not a bunch of kids trying to play games. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What else? Anybody else has something to say about this? Well, the big thing to think about is this. The Bible, Bible translators don't play telephone. Um, they're not going back to the manuscript from last year. They're going back to the manuscript from the 2nd century, and the 3rd century, and the 4th century. So when you have all these different translations, and God willing, we're going to talk about translations next week, but when you have all these different translations, it's not as if, well, this translation's building on this translation, it's building on this translation, it's building on this translation. No, what they do is they want to go back to the original Hebrew and Greek, so they're all going back to the exact same manuscripts. That's the difference there. There's no, there's no telephone being done like that. That's right. That's right. It's like we have somebody right here, and they've got the message, and all of you come up and hear from him personally what the message is, and then you write it down. That's what Bible translators are doing. That's good. Ultimately, our confidence is in God's love and His faithfulness to preserve His Word for us. That's what our ultimate confidence is in. And we thank the Lord for that. 